many Germans had because, what the heck is this? My computer froze and blinked in, in and out. I'm sorry, I just got a big ripple. I hope I'm still on. So rippled off and on, Teams, computer stayed. All right, must've been some kind of power surge in my house. Ah, okay, so back to this. Germans of the middle class want security and you'll see this in um, the events leading up to Nazi Germany. It'll be middle class Germans. By the way, there's Gutenberg, the inventor of the printing press, printing money, and oh my God, is what he's saying. And so with that, are we still on? Good. So that's we get to Hitler. And this is probably where I quit first period. We were just getting to this. Hitler actually was part of the free corps fighting in the streets of Munich in the post-war, post-World War I Civil War. He was recruited by the army to spy at first on left wing, but then right wing groups. Here he is as a veteran. That's him in Belgium in 1917 with the mustache uh, for that veterans war. Here is his card he got for becoming a spy of the ultra right wing German Workers Party, the Deutsche Arbeiter Party, Adolf Hitler. He was a spy. And so in 1920, as the Weimar Republic is being established, he has free time, unlike most of the work, most of the people who were um, scraping out a living and then they would meet in beer halls. He would get the attention of Gregor Strasser, the head of the party, and Strasser saw potential in Hitler. Hitler had the appeal of a veteran. He had this uh, savvy to him. Just a sec. I don't know why it gives this up here. Whatever, I'm not going to worry about. He had this savvy that understood how to sway masses. He had an Austrian accent because he had, he had fled Austria to avoid the draft and then joined the Bavarian army in World War I. But he had that accent, and normally that would be seen as a negative, but he didn't sound like a polished pol um, German politician of the Weimar Republic. He sounded like a regular German, okay, whatever that means. And so, Soon he would be he would quit the spying and become a member of the German Workers Party who would change their name to the Nationalist Socialist German Working Workers Party and national for nationalism socialism because the Socialist Party was the most popular the biggest party even though it wasn't near a majority but the biggest party in Germany and they want to take advantage of that and also their vision of socialism was remember Das will I'm sorry Das will um, the mass will, the people's will, uh, the group all together. Well, that was a German idea of socialist, all together. The, and this is where you get Nazi. Nash, or, well, first off, let's get to national socialists, whatever we we'll call them in Germany. Nazis, you take the first two letters of nationalistic, which is uh, German for nationalist, and socialistic, which has a ZI in it, and that being abbreviation. The Germans, yeah, they would call them Nazis, but, um, most of the time in Germany, it was National Socialists. That became the one-party state. Britain and France, that's where they really hit the Nazis. And then, of course, the United States. And so here are some of the early members of the... of the. Um, there's the Free Corps right there. And then these are German Workers Party. And notice they have the swastika to take advantage of the veterans from the Free Corps. And I love some of them with traditional Bavarian outfits. Here is Hitler meeting with Gregor Strasser right there, but in one of the beer halls. Um, if you go to one of the uh, couple, one of the big beer halls, uh, the Hofra House in Munich, kind of a big tourist site now, but the upstairs still has fascist symbols on it because it survived the war and they have not redone the wall. And what Hitler decided using veterans of the Free Corps still with their uniforms, they decided to take advantage of the hyperinflation to do a coup, the beer hall putsch. What is a putsch? Don't forget that means, is it working? Okay, that means a coup. And in 1923, to take advantage of the hyperinflation. And the thought was, Nazis, who were also members of the Free Corps, would dash into Munich, take over the city government, and install the Nazi government. And then the thought was, as soon as they started in Munich, this would spread across the country. And there was no Nazi party for the most part outside of, of Munich. 
And here are laughing Nazis before they started. Here they're going through the streets of Munich. Here's Hitler in a comical German lederhosen. But to pick as their leader, they brought back Erich Ludendorff, who was the guy who invented the term total war in World War I. And he would be the head of state, but here he is with Hitler, who is rising up in the party. And they thought they could also appeal to the army. Here's some army officers right there. Where's Ernst Rome? Right there, okay. So here's a very stylized picture of the Nazis um, going through Munich and to carry out the coup. And they would memorialize this every year once the Nazis took power. But the reality was it failed miserably. It was an absolute disaster. They drove in, nobody joined them. The police surrounded them, the small army, um, the small, uh, you know, the German had a tiny army. They sent troops, put down the uh, coup, all over. And so here you can see, you know, this is not the rallying. People is more like curiosity seekers. And this should end the Nazis right there. They were humiliated, a disaster. They committed treason. By the way, Ludendorff just went to, a, to his home. They didn't arrest him. But he had a sympathetic judge. And the sympathetic judge allowed Hitler, he was a right wing, okay, he didn't like the Nazis per se, but hated the outcome of World War I and bought into the myth that Germany could have won this war. And they were able to turn this into a forum for Hitler, a forum for Hitler to explain his uh, German point of view or his Nazi point of view and to, oh, huh. there he is in prison, there we um, dictate his, there he is, um, oh, he's allowed to go to prison. And in prison, in Landisburg prison, was basically uh, like a country club. He had a, a couple different cells. He had people come to prepare him food. Wealthy admirers who saw him as a uh, fighter against communism uh, gave him money and supplies. His personal secretary right here, Rudolf Hess, would actually sit in the cell with him and di um, take dictation, and which would become his memoir. And instead of serving a long sentence, he served less than two years, got out of prison, and the Nazi party survived as a tiny party. It was a minuscule party as the Germany came out of hyperinflation. But Hitler survived and had a small and loyal cadre. It was like he beat the system. So imagine this little group, but they're waiting for something horrible to happen that will get him into power. And while he was there, he would write his memoir, Mein Kampf or My Struggle. And if you ever read Mein Kampf, I had to read for a class. It was a horrible read, not just for its a terrible philosophy, but, but for also because of its, uh, just, it, it makes no sense. I mean, you can almost imagine Hitler walking around his prison cell ranting and just writing down whatever he said. It talks about the evils of Versailles, it goes on and on about the evils of, of Jews, and then all of a sudden gets on this long rant about syphilis. And it's like, what the heck is he even talking about? And so people would, you know, all Germans had to have Mein Kampf and read it. They would study in schools and um, probably had no idea what they were reading. But let's get to Nazi ideology. By the way, there he is coming out of prison. We decided a coup won't work and they'll do it through the political process. There's one of his cronies, a World War I hero as a fighter pilot, Hermann Goering. And this is in front, this is in the main square in Munich. So let's get to the ideology. Number one, Versailles. Versailles, the Treaty of Versailles, would be the cause of all their problems, imposed on them by the Allies. They lost land, they lost uh, their colonies, they had their... Um, they were humiliated, they had to take blame for the war, and they lost their army. And he said he would rebuild that army. He knew how to get the military on their side. And the military, who knew they were beaten in World War I, was pushing that myth that they didn't really lose. They didn't want to take the blame for the insane decisions of like unrestricted submarine warfare. So Versailles, all their problems were because of this horrible treaty that never should have been imposed. And so here is one, I showed you this picture before, but here's Wilson, uh, Clemenceau of France, and Lloyd George of Britain, and Germany off to the gallows because of Versailles. But here's a German one of the Germans working, and, and this is an anti-Versailles one of working and working and toiling and being whipped an entire generation 
of Germans. Every generation, you notice it's like the grandfather, father, and son all working for the rest of their life because of Versailles. And why did this happen? Why did Germany sign this treaty and a toxic, dangerous philosophy called, okay, it's Dokstoselegend, which literally means it's a German word, which that's the great thing about the German language. It's got a word for everything, but it means stab in the back. Germany was stabbed in the back. There was an enemy within. This very vivid poster shows a German soldier dead with the knife in the back of his neck. And what that means is the stab in the back. And make sure you get this down. There were traitors within Germany. And by the way, if there are traitors within Germany that caused them to lose, doesn't that fit quite well? with the totalitarianism of Benito Mussolini. And so here is, it's a vague, it's a businessman here, but this is supposed to be like uh, intelligentsia, which were socialists, stabbing German soldiers in the back. And how do we know that they're free corn veterans? You see the little Nazi symbol right there, or the swastika, I'm sorry, but that's just supposed to represent the free corps. And they're being stabbed in the back. This is a toxic philosophy because it without a doubt worked for right-wing parties in Germany. But this would lead to a time where if the right-wing parties say there are traitors within, our enemies are traitors, and when that party takes power, what do you do with traitors? And you'll see the exact same thing with this happen in the United States with um, the stab in the back after the Vietnam War. The U.S. should not have lost that war, which is patently... Um, so the U.S. should not have lost that war because of enemies within the country, which if anybody who knows anything about the Vietnam War knows it's patently ridiculous. But what a toxic fuel. If people think about the reason why the politics are so toxic, it just builds and brews, and it's been brewing for 40 years in the U.S. And here's another example of this. Um, this is a socialist. Remember the enemy of the fascist. Here's another one. He... Um, Okay, I'm not even sure what he's holding, but hitting the German in the back. Remember that myth, they marched home in good order, so the German army never really lost. Number two, and I don't know why this remains. Let me get rid of this something. I can't get rid of this. I have no idea what I did. So, scapegoat. You find your enemy and demonize him. Why did we lose? Let's find the enemies, which, by the way, fits in. Remember the elements of fascism. So number one, who is the number one enemy? Without a doubt, the communists. And that includes the socialists. They were opposed to the war. They even tried to rebel, they even tried to rebel after the war. The moderate socialists of the Social Democratic Party took over the government and signed the Treaty of Versailles in 1918. I'm sorry, 1919. They are the cause of the war. So communists who said this, or socialists in Germany and communists who said this war is horrible, we shouldn't do it. They're the cause of the war, why we lost. But also liberals. So liberals who are not socialists. Remember we talked about liberal thought with fascism. Those are the ones who believed in individual rights. Those are the people who wanted democracy and constitutional law. They made us weak and allowed for insidious forces to take over the government. Next, businessmen business interests who got rich off the war, and when the money flowed to peace, they stabbed the German army in the back, especially finance, especially bankers. Why bankers? Hmm, couldn't there be a myth about what kind of people were bankers? Next, Slavs. These are the Eastern Europeans. We talked about this before World War I, so Poles, uh, 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 Poles, I'm sorry, uh, down in Yugoslavia, the Serbians, but the biggest Slavic nation of them all was Russia. Hmm, Slavs, Soviet Union, do you see a connection? But who's behind all of them? This poster on the right, oh, I also, I almost forgot one. They're also very much posed in this educational elite. The educational elite that, like scientists and political scientists, who were muddying up the waters of true thought with their science 
that made people believe they had rights, made people believe that they couldn't control their own fate. They were weakening German, Germany. And that's one of the great ironies of World War II. To this day, people will talk about, well, the German science and German scientists were so amazing and they nearly won the war with their great technology. No, Nazis were by definition anti-science. If anybody went against their ideology, they were opposed. There was no such thing as scientific truth. The only truth that mattered was the truth that came out of the party, and the party was the voice of the leader. But who's behind all of them? The Jews. And look at this picture right here. Do we want to be a good German, or do you notice the hammer and sickle? But this is a horrible caricature of a Jew. And you're going to find all of these posters here. Jews were the businessmen. As you see this, the bankers behind Britain, United States and the Soviet Union, the main allies of World War I. But the biggest Jewish population in the world were Poland and the Soviet Union. Slavs, many of the leading Jews, were also leaders of the Socialist Party. Uh, Rosa Luxemburg, the most famous of the, of the socialists who would be executed by the free car in 1919 in Berlin, she was Jewish. Many of the leaders of the Bolshevik Revolution were Jewish. And so many of the intellectual and the scientists were Jewish. One of the reasons why Einstein, uh, Albert Einstein got out of Germany, um, one of the few Jews they let out and let go into the United States because he was Einstein, fled because of the anti-Jewish hostility. In fact, one of the great ironic twists of fate, so many Jewish scientists fled and then eventually got to the United States that they would help build the atomic bomb. It was not ready to drop on Germany, but Japan was still holding out when the bomb was ready. So that leads to the next. Oh, so, but don't forget, so that means Jews were behind everything. I should have, Germany had a very small Jewish population. Germany had a, a really small Jewish population. And so it's easy to scapegoat a tiny population. And so much of German policy is going to be to force Jews to leave. Next, we mentioned the superior race with this idea of an uber mention or a master race. And this, I've mentioned this before, that fake German mythology before World War I to unify the new German empire, that the Germans are this special race called Aryans. The Nazis grabbed hold of this and they said, see, we didn't come up with this philosophy. We're just doing what Germans believed. And so this classic blonde haired blue eyed, um, German, a lot of very stylistic, you notice these are anonymous, but stylized Germans, the new people for 1938. And here is uh, Hitler Youth raising money, but that Aryan idea, and they even had uh, Nazi scientists, remember all scientists meant that they did the Nazi philosophy, try to find the perfect German, uh, the Aryan face, because this, there could be a situation where someone's a true blooded, 100% Aryan, which remember I told you this before, completely made up garbage, but it sounds like science. They might be a full-blooded Aryan, but they have dark hair. Let me think of someone with dark hair. I'm, I can't think of anybody. I don't know about, about but Hitler. And so they measured the face and the, the cheek, and this might surprise you, but the perfect Aryan face looked exactly like Hitler. Amazing. But they came up with this master philosophy, and therefore, that's why they're scapegoats. That's why we have all these enemies, because everybody is jealous of German superiority, and they're trying to undermine and destroy and weaken them. And so Jews are going to be portrayed as dirty, horrible, subhuman beasts, and brilliant masterminds bent on world domination and destroying the powerful Aryans. You should see the contradiction right there. But you know what? That doesn't matter. The contradiction, hey, fine, whatever. And they would really buy into a philosophy that began in the United States. And I've mentioned this once before, eugenics, with the idea that humans could be bred for purity and you do not want impure blood coming in. And so that means people who are not Aryans. And yes, there would be a racial element of people from Asia or Africa or that kind of thing. But to the German point of view, that's a long ways away. We're going to focus on the Slavs. Now, there's no difference. It's just, it's just um, ethnic groups. 
but Germany had them as dirty people. And look what happens, pure German breeding, pure German Aryans. But you get one of these lesser people and look at the faces and how they draw. And yes, this came from the United States. Hitler greatly admired American racial policies I mentioned before. That old Jim Crow thing he thought was a pretty good idea. He loved Henry Ford, who was known for intense anti-Semitism. And this would appeal to other places. Here is a recruiting poster for the German SS or Staatsstufel, which would become part of the military, uh, poorly led but fanatical soldiers and uh, for especially the last three years of the war, but recruiting in the Netherlands with a huge population of people who kind of fit that Aryan idea. But here's also in Norway. And so when the Reichstag fell in 1945, early May 45, SS units were holding out against the Soviets. And most of the SS units were Norwegian. I know that sounds weird, but they're Norwegian because they fought to the death because they could, they knew they could never go home. And so once again, we get to, I'm sorry, that's a little bit cut off, but the leader principle, their fear, the, the leader can do no wrong. You notice how this fits in, but not completely fascism. And so here's him, and um, this is right after he got out of prison, it's actually 27, giving a speech, ranting and raving. By the way, you'll notice more and more he started wearing a suit because when that's when he realized we have to go through political means, but any chance he get, get, he would don the brown shirt for the private guards or the kind of the private army. He didn't have a lot of control of them, called the brown shirts. And that whole cult of the leader who could never be wrong. And that's one of the great things Hitler would do. Hitler, by using his speeches, would lie all the time. Lie, make up stuff, contradict himself. But once you convince people they could be never wrong, if the leader lies or someone thinks, wait a minute, the leader said something totally different the other day. Either the leader is wrong or you're wrong. The leader can't be wrong. So that means you're wrong. And that means you never really know what's true. The thing that authoritarians do, their great skill is to keep people with this sense that we never know what's quite true, we never know what's quite right, so the leader must know best. So they never, you never know the truth. I thought I clicked it. I didn't click it. By definition, authoritarians are always dishonest. And it's a tactic. It's not like Hitler thought about this and went through you know, this years of study or research. He had just had that gift to know how to sway people. Once he brought them under the sway, he knew that that skill would be used. And so there's gonna be pictures and posters of everywhere of Hitler, Ein Volk, Ein Reich, Ein Fuhrer would be the slogan everywhere. And this, um, this poster really shows it. Look at the mass behind them. No faces, no nothing. The only person that matters, Hitler. Uh-oh, are you still there? Yay, okay. And here's another one, the faceless masses behind them voting yes for Hitler. And the only person we see, the only person that matters is Hitler. And that leads to Das Volk. The mass, we talked about this before, the mass operating together alone, we are weak, but together under the leader, under the party, we have power. And that's why Hitler and the Nazi Germany wanted to make sure every single person got a radio. Big deal, they got a radio. And this was not just to boost German industry, but it was also so everyone could hear the propaganda. And they looked into this brand new technology called television. Uh, they kind of went off the wrong track on, on TV and uh, a little bit different than what's gonna be developed in the United States, which would actually be a much better television in the 1940s. It's invented in Idaho of all places, but the people, and that's where you get the term socialist. The socialist means not socialism, uh, but the idea of social of all people together. And I love that voting yes for greater Germany, all with doing that Bellamy salute. That's what socialists meant. And lastly, our great people need room. We need places to live to become true Aryans, AKA Lebensraum. And that literally means living space. And where was their living space? In the East. All that land wasted by the Slavs in Poland or the Soviet Union. 
And so this picture right here shows the small population of France, the small population of Britain, but look at the huge population of Germany. They need more land. And Hitler's ideal goal is to get out of the decrepit, uh, decaying, immoral cities and become farmers. And by the way, if the Germans go into, if, the, if Nazi Germany takes over the Soviet Union and Ukraine, what, what, what about the people there? They will be either forced out, made into slaves, or removed. So there's no long-term plan for Germany to go to war. But Hitler is thinking with Laban's wrong. We must remove our enemies, the communists, the Soviet Union, and take their land. So from day one, he is thinking at some day, the great war for civilization between the evils of communists and the new super state, national socialism, there'll be a war. And so here's a picture of Germany, um, their vision of this new German state. And you notice all this area would be taken by a greater Germany. And this would be taken over right here, along with someday maybe Sweden. Eventually, this would be greater Germany by 1940. Well, actually, by 43. Of course, it's all going to be conquered, taken over. You know, it's a bunch of Poland. Austria, part of the Czech Republic, etc. And so the Nazi party, this came out and this was in Germans, the Mein Kampf was part of German propaganda, but the Great Depression. Hit. And the thing about the Great Depression is this was the shock that opened the door. Here are German people picking through garbage. This is in, in Berlin, picking through garbage. You know, in Berlin, somewhere in uh, by 32, it was anywhere from 30 to 50%. So many people, they had a bad way of keeping stats, so we don't know exactly. And so many people just given up hope. And what this meant is parties on the fringe who said, this system that we have developed, the kind of regulated uh, monopolistic capitalism of the Weimar Republic is not working. And who has an answer? Well, this meant the growth of the socialists and the growth of the Nazis the socialists, and here are the Nazis. And here is a German a Nazi poster and he's pulling the snake of unemployment down. We will get unemployment down. And here, the National Socialist German Workers' Party. We will get people back to work. And so here is an example of two parties that all of a sudden grew because of the Depression. And the German government in 31, 32, remember we mentioned this before, uh, Hoover did the same thing in, in the United States in 32, austerity. They cut government spending. That slashed demand and the worst year of the depression, it was in the US too, 1932. Uh, that's Gerhard Brewing right here. Brewing was the uh, man who led uh, austerity. People despised him. And so what do we have then? We have this middle moderate group of basic kind of pro-business um, Germans who were fearful of government spending because of inflation. They did austerity. And then you have the Nazis and the socialists and the communists on the other side demanding change. And in 32, by then, the Nazis had become the biggest party, but nowhere near the majority because nobody would join them. Remember, this is not a winner-take-all system. Germany had, Germany had a parliament, and they allowed for many different parties, so a coalition had to be formed. So here's a, a poster for Germany. Remember, Roosevelt did the same thing. Hitler over Germany. Remember, Roosevelt flew that plane. Here's the Nazis saying, we are new and exciting and dramatic, and here, vote for the Nazis, vote for the worker, the Arbeiter. And the Nazi vote went up. But the other biggest parties were the communists and the socialists. Now, most people did not realize how much the communist party and the socialist party hated each other. Here are the socialists, here are the communists. They despised each other. 
the communists thought the socialists were uh, were not really socialists. They were capitalists in disguise. They um, didn't really believe in workers' rights. They were just, um, in fact, to the communist point of view, the socialists weren't a lot different to the way the communists felt about FDR in the United States. The socialists thought the communists were stooges of Stalin. But together, if they were unified, would form an also a big party. And here's an actual ballot from the election in November of 1932. And look at all the parties, and this person voted communist. But here's the National Socialist German Workers Party. Here's the SDP, the Socialist Party, the Communist Party. That's a great picture of the ballot. And in 1932, the only thing you need to know is basically this. In 32, the biggest party, but not a majority, were the Nazis. But in November 32, and this is what we got to get down, get this down. The Nazis lost seats and the socialists and the communists gained seats. In fact, the socialists and communists together made 40% of the vote, but they hated each other. But what if they unify? What if they're able to unify, get a few more people and get up to 50%? So the Nazis lost power in the Reichstag the socialists and the communists gain power. What came out of this? The fear of communism, especially amongst the business leaders, but more importantly, the middle class of Germany, who was barely surviving, it's relatively small, but they were surviving the depression, but the legacy of hyperinflation also hung in their mind. And they were fearful of the communists, fearful of the instability, fearful of Stalin, which Good reason to be fearful of Stalin, even though Stalin had no real power. Communists didn't particularly like Stalin either. And that is why in January 1933, these people, the right-wing parties, the moderate parties, fearful of communism, made Hitler the chancellor. Well, chancellor is the equivalent of the prime minister in Britain, they represent the, either the largest party or the largest coalition of parties. He had to have members of other parties in his government, but he became the chancellor. Oh, here he is. I did not mean to hit that. Sorry. Here he is, uh, came to the office from the head of state, which in Germany it's called the president. There's no monarch anymore. And that was Paul von Hindenburg. Remember Hindenburg from World War I. Hindenburg hated him. He called him the bohemian corporal. But he was stuck with him. By the way, you know, Hitler played the role of a politician. So conservatives in the German government thought they could control Hitler. They thought he was a buffoon and a moron. Now, Hitler was not brilliant, but he was no buffoon. He was determined. Determined to any chance to grab power, he would take it. But they thought he's better than the communists. And so here he is. Germany and conservatives with the ball and chain on Hitler so he doesn't get out of control. And the same deal is, all right, here's Hitler put into power. The German government's out of control. We can control him, but he's better than the communists. And who knows what would have happened? Hitler was going to push and take power any way he could. Not that he had a master plan, but he was so audacious that it shocked people. Here is a torchlight procession of Nazis going through the Brandenburg Gate to the Unter den Linden. Now, I showed you this picture before with unicycles. Now it's a torchlit procession, procession. And they open up the shutter speed, open up the shutter so it had a very slow explosion, exposure. And that's why it gives the torch just looks like a line going through. A pretty amazing shot. And then a month after Hitler took power, the Reichstag caught fire. The German parliamentary building caught fire. And in the basement of it, they found a babbling, half-naked Dutch from the Netherlands, Dutch communist by the name of Mer Marinus van der Lubbe. Van der Lubbe. And he had rags and gasoline. And clearly, he was part of starting the fire. There's the Reichstag burning. 
and there's von, von, der, Blad, von der Luba uh, under trial. Now, maybe there's a lot of evidence they probably did it, but this seemed to confirm all of what the Nazis said. Communists were enemies. Communists were coming to get us. Communists were under the influence of other countries. That's why a Dutch communist, and to their point of view, as a Dutch communist, you know Stalin and the Soviet Union was behind this. This confirmed everything Hitler said, and they were able to declare under the German Constitution a state of emergency where the chancellor essentially had the power of, of being a dictator. Hmm, not working. And then, oh, and then a few months later, oh, I almost forgot something. And what's the first thing they did? They banned the Communist Party. They banned the socialists. They arrested members of the labor union. And with opponents gone, the Reichstag meeting in the Berlin Opera House, which they would meet in till the end of the war, they would pass the Enabling Act. And what you need to know about the Enabling Act is this, and this is the Enabling Act, Enabling Act, I can't even say it, Enabling Act signed by Hitler. Hitler would take the power of a dictator. Oops, back, 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 back. And that's how Hitler took power. A loophole in the Weimar Constitution and, and the Enabling Act, Hitler would take power. Now, to this day, we're not sure if von der Lübe um, burnt down the Reichstag. It seems like, like a far too big of a job for one person. Was this the Nazis who burnt it down themselves or actually helped communists do it as agent provocateurs and burnt it down? We don't know. People will say over and over again that the Nazis started the fire and burnt it down. Maybe they did. We're not 100% sure. I lean towards, yeah, they probably had something to do with it. But there's never been 100% evidence. And so we don't know. But that's not as important as this. An emergency happened and Hitler, the opportunist that he was, took advantage of a scared population, shocked by the depression, years of war, the advantage of the, take, took advantage of that myth about World War I to take powers as a dictator. And once he had it, he held it. Almost immediately after the state of emergency, they created the first concentration camps. These would be places for political prisoners that would be put in. And most people think to this day, quite incorrectly, that the concentration camps were there for Jews. No. They were there for communists, members of labor, labor unions, and also members of opposition political parties. If they, Jews might be in there if they were also known communists or that sort of thing. But this is Dachau right here. And they hastily put up barracks that were based upon a horse stables. So that's where you get that distinctive look. Uh, Dachau was all men. Pretty soon there would be over 300 concentration camps and over a thousand sub subsidiary camps. One more thing, even though they would be very much like concentration camps, these are not the same as the death camps that would be started in 1942 as part of this horrific logic of total war to get rid of an enemy within. By the way, the logic is completely illogical, but these are the death camps and they would all be in Poland and they would be for Jews in areas that Germany conquered and not wanting an enemy within during total war. They are different. People put them together. They are not the same. So here is at Dachau. And uh, this, it was an old uh, factory. And that's where they built and then built the rest of it, um, the camp near there. Here is the amazing, I know the picture didn't come out as good as I wanted but the sculpture that's about the gate and the, the fence was electrified and people were in the concentration camp. You can imagine just the, the torture of being in a concentration camp, beyond belief torture. And so many of them took their own lives rather than go through that hell by jumping against the barbed wire fence. And so that's what that signifies. And, but things would change a little bit when the United States entered the war, and it looked like with the U.S. and the Soviet Union and Britain, Germany would lose. 
And this would be at the front gate. I took this picture. Many people have pictures of this. Uh, the front gate at Dachau, right outside of Munich. And it says, Arbeit macht free, Arbeit macht frei, which means work will make you free. A dirty, awful joke. They would put the same thing in the death camps, every concentration camp. And Germany had another election. And this election, it's also called a plebiscite. But with all the parties removed by 1934, now there's only one thing to vote for. The National, the National Socialistic German Workers' Party. And there's Hitler. And these are all Rudolf Hess, Hermann Goering, Goebbels, Ernst Röhm. <laughs> Poppin was an opportunist member of another party. But one party, guess what? They got over 90% of the vote. I, I wonder how brave it had to be for those who did not vote for Nazi Germany. And then a little bit later on, they didn't even have the fake party anymore. It was just, are you for Hitler or not? Yeah and no. And I love how they put yeah with a big circle. Nine. Are you sure you want to do that? by 38. So we have a little bit left. We'll finish tomorrow. Uh, yeah, this is a pretty amazing time. Um, a lot of myths about this and a lot of mistakes that people made. I should add, I'll just tell you real fast. Hitler's, uh, the kind of the Nazi private army would be called uh, the assault division. Originally, they were called uh, the sports battalion, but that didn't sound mean enough. And these are the ones who would battle and beat up uh, Jews or communists on the street. They wore brown shirts because they had a bunch of cheap uniforms from Germ that were going to be for German uh, colonial forces in Africa. That's why they wore brown. The assault division or simply the SR, the SA. And here they are, uh, a very crude water cooling, but a good, effective one, uh, beating up the Jewish owner of a store and putting up signs, a base way to intimidate Jews and make them leave Germany. Okay, so do those questions. Uh, we'll finish anything tomorrow. Remember what I told you. Anybody who finishes the, um, the 1980s on, so I believe it's the last page or page and a half of that review packet, it, use the review book. If you have that done by next Thursday, I will give you extra credit. Extra credit. Just show me. Yes, extra credit. By next Thursday. Have a great day. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye, thank you.